Alrighty, so hi everyone. Thanks for joining our TAGX talk for the month of April. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Jeff McDermott, who's the Science and Technology Advisor from TEDx Genomics. So over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Karen. And uh, thank you everyone for coming along today for our April TAGX event. Um, before we get into today's very exciting talk, I just wanted to take a quick five minutes to introduce you all to spatial transcriptomics. Um, the product that was used to generate all the really cool data that you're about to see. As hopefully you're all aware, at Tenex Genomics, we have three complementary pillars of technology platforms. There's a Chromium single cell system, which as the name suggests, is a platform and suite of assays for examining single cell suspensions to ultimately assess cellular heterogeneity. Whilst a lot of great discoveries have been made using the Chromium platform, Obviously, when you dissociate tissues into single cell suspensions, you lose a lot of interesting information that is natural to the state of the tissue. So adding back the where to the what is critical for lots of researchers. And that's why we have two other pillars of technology platforms, which we call Visium and Xenium. Both of these technologies allow you to capture gene and protein expression with spatial context. Um, we don't have time to compare and contrast the Visium and Xenium platforms today. But at the highest level, Visium provides an unbiased gene expression measurements based on extracting molecules from within the tissue down to the surface of a slide and then sequencing those molecules on an Illumina platform. Whereas the Xenium platform allows for targeted detection of transcript panels from within the actual tissue itself and therefore doesn't require the use of a next generation sequencer. We'll be talking lots more about Xenium throughout the year, but for today, let's focus on Visium spatial transcriptomics and step through what this technology actually is, and most importantly, what it can deliver for your research. We'll begin with a high-level overview of the Visium kit structure and the workflow. Firstly, there are two different kits in the Visium family, and as their name suggests, they're designed to work with different input materials, being either fresh frozen or FFPE tissues. Although these kits differ slightly in how transcripts are ultimately detected, they do share the same high-level workflow as described here. You basically section your tissue directly onto the surface of the Visium slide and then image the tissue using either H&E staining or immunofluorescence. Next is the transfer of molecules from within the tissue section down to the surface of the Visium slide for barcoding. And once that is complete, you move your newly barcoded transcripts from the slide into tube format to complete a sequencing library. The overall process from sample to sequencing ready library takes about two pretty comfortable days in the lab to complete. And finally, I do want to mention that for both types of Visium assays, we have ready to use robust workflows, including demonstrator protocols for various sample types and freely available turnkey software tools. So if you're new to the world of spatial transcriptomics and want to apply it to your research, but feel perhaps somewhat intimidated about where to begin, then we have solutions for you across the entire spectrum of the workflow. Now let's step through some key parameters, the actual Visium slide itself. Um, what I'm going to describe here is applicable across both the fresh frozen and FFPE version of the kit. And firstly, there are four capture areas per slide, and you can see that each capture area is 6.5 by 6.5 millimeters in size. Within each capture area, there's an array of approximately 5,000 barcoded spots. And if we zoom into one of these spots, you can see that they are 55 micron in diameter with 100 micron center to center distance. This obviously isn't single cell resolution. Um, that's something that the R&D team is definitely working very hard on, and I'll have a quick note on um, that at the end of this presentation. But finally, to refocus on our current Visium slide, you'll see that each barcoded spot is actually a lawn of oligonucleotides with their structure shown here. Importantly, each spot contains its own barcode sequence, which gets appended to the transcript during the initial stages of the workflow. So we sequence the transcript to tell us its identity, and then we also sequence the barcode that's appended to the transcript, which informs us whereabouts on this 2D grid that transcript originated from. So let's walk through the data types you can extract out of the Visium kit. We'll use the mouse brain tissue for the example here and begin by showing you that you retain the ability to get H&E image using Visium. This means you can still do all your visual annotation of the tissue. Of course, this is typically where your analysis journey would end when using standard histology. But with Visium, we not only get the HD image of your tissue, but you also capture the underlying molecular information across the entire tissue in the form of whole transcriptome gene expression. But the real power of the kit comes from when we combine these two data types. That gives rise to the image in the middle here, 
where the spatial location of whole transcriptome gene expression can be overlaid on the HE image. So again, you retain the ability to visually interrogate the tissue, but you now can also query the underlying molecular profile in the form of whole transcriptome gene expression. And to round out the presentation, I wanna briefly cover some really key Visium related product launches that we'll have this year. The first is an upcoming extension of our Visium FFPE kit, which will allow you to detect both gene and protein expression from the exact same tissue slice. The second new product is a very exciting instrument that we call the Cytosyst. This instrument will transfer analytes from your FFPE tissue sections already on standard glass slides down onto the Visium capture slides. So this means that you can actually section directly onto plain glass slides, then image and choose which sections you want to move forward with. Alternatively, it means you can now access pre-cut FFP slides that you may already have archived somewhere. And finally, I guess the big daddy of Visium product launches this year is our Visium HD assay. And here we're taking the resolution of the Visium from its current size of 55 micron, right down to just single digit micron resolution, which means you can profile tissues at single cell scale. Um, this isn't coming until late 2022, um, so stay tuned for more updates throughout the year. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for your time today. Um, if you want to know more about anything uh, that I've discussed, then please just reach out to us um, anytime. And um, I'll hand it over. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me, and I hope everyone will be able to see my screen, probably. If you don't, this is the time to let me know. Um, so I'm Rebecca Schumann. I'm postdoctoral researcher at ANU at the John Curtin School in the Eccles Institute of Neuroscience. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how we are going to, or how we did use the spatial transcriptomics technology from 10x Genomics to identify transcriptional gene responses in the degenerating retina. So I'll tell you a bit about the retinas and why spatial transcriptomics is really great and powerful for the retina. So the retina is a really highly structured organ. Retina is what lines the very back of your eye. And it's got this really very conserved structure and very high structure. So from the inside, as you can see here, you go from the inside to the outside. So this is the inside of the eye. This is the back of the eye. You've got this very organized layer. So the optic nerve fiber layer, your ganglion cells or the ganglion cell layer. Then this is called the inner plexiform layer, which is where all the nerve processes come together between the ganglion cells and the um, neurons that lie in the middle of the retina, which are amacrine cells, horizontal cells, bipolar cells. And then you have the outer plexiform layer, again, where processes of those neurons connect. And, and then the outer nuclear layer, which is where your photoreceptor sits. You also have miller cells, and miller cells are special, they're glial cells, and they basically um, span the whole entire retinal layer. So underneath the um, photoreceptor layer, you have the retinal pigmented epithelium, which is there to nourish the photoreceptors and um, helps in the visual cycle. And then underneath that, you've got the choroid, and what's not shown here underneath that is the sclera. So in humans, we have the macula, which is the very specialized region of the retina that allows for your central and very high acuity vision. So we study age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of vision loss in the developed world. And in Australia, one in seven Australians over the age of 50 will be affected or are already affected by AMD. There's no known treatment for AMD, particularly the prevalent form dry AMD, which accounts for 90% of all AMD cases. So it's a very devastating disease. You start losing your central vision and eventually your whole visual field will disappear and you can become blind if you develop late stage AMD. Despite this, the pathology of AMD remains unclear. It's a very heterogeneous disease. What is thought to happen is that it's a buildup of reactive oxygen species in the retina through a lifetime exposure of light and the high oxygen environment of the retina. And that leads to inflammation. And that recruits my microglia that migrate to that side of damage. They in turn um, get activated and then recruit blood-borne macrophages, and that leads to cytokine secretion, complement activation, and phagocytosis of photoreceptors, which is not great because if you don't have photoreceptors, you don't see. Um, so, what does this look like in humans? So, I'm showing you here the fundus image, and most of you will have gotten your fundus image on some point when you go to the optometrist and have your eye, check, eye health checked. This is what they do when they look at the back of your eye. This is what it should look like from a normal um, person, this is the optic nerve, and here is your highly dense area called the macula. 
So in early AMD, you get what's called Drusen deposits. There are these sort of spots here and they're sort of fuddy deposits. It's not really clear what exactly they are, but that's a very early sign that can then develop to geographic atrophy where you can see here, you get really lesions within the back of the retina. So that's death of photoreceptors. Or you can get neovascular AMD where you get infiltration of novel blood cells into the retina and that can cause bleeding and scarring. So AMD is a really highly localized phenotype and we use a mouse model to study AMD um, called the photooxidative damage rodent model. And what we do is we use multiple wild type mice and expose them to 100,000 lux white LED light. So normal office lighting is usually around 500 lux. So you get an idea, it's like staring in the sun. And we do this for um, up to seven days. And this induces a retinal degeneration, which re recapitulates hallmarks of AMD. So the oxidative stress, inflammation, and that focal photoreceptors are there. And in this model, we can induce a very consistent, reproducible degenerative phenotype and it allows us to functionally and morphologically assess um, hallmarks of AMD. So what does it look like on a molecular and um, um, scale in the retina? So this is cross-sectioned across the retina of a mouse that's been exposed to photooxidative stress. Hypermia said that this is actually control and we have one, three, five, and seven days and we've stained this in blue for nuclei and red for tunnel, which stains um, cell death. So you can see that at three days of exposure, you see, start to see cell death in the outer nuclear layer, and this is your photoreceptor layer. So this is where all, all these nuclei indicate a single photoreceptor nucleus. So it's quite a lot of them, and they start to die. And then by five days, there's a lot more. And what you can also see is that this layer is a lot thinner compared to three days, and particularly compared to control. So this is really reflecting the death of the photoreceptor. And at seven days, that's even worse. And when we look for infiltrating microglia macrophages, so this is GFAP, which is a real um, protein, you can really see that at one day already there is an infiltration of real cells from the inner nuclear layer into the um, retina, <clears throat> which gets progressively worse and sort of gets out of hand. And it's almost like a, like a perpetuating, self perpetuating mechanism that is very difficult to control and very difficult to rein back. And, um, Heal, so to speak. So we know phenotypically what AMD looks like. We have increased photoreceptor cell death, as we can see by funnel, by tunnel, sorry, that leads to own alphanin. And we've got this activation and infiltration of immune cells. Transcriptionally, we also know a fair bit. So we know that we're losing visual cycle-related genes, obviously, because we're losing photoreceptors. We know that there is an increase in inflammatory gene expression, complement pathway gets activated, and interferon-related genes get expressed. And there's actually a, a landmark study, a genome-wide association study that has identified major risk variants that are associated with AMD. So we know genetically a little bit of what's going on, but it's, like I said, very heterogeneous. And it's really not clear what is the initial factor, where does it all start, and how can we potentially target it to stop it from getting so bad. So these are the remaining questions. Where does the dysregulation occur? How is it initiated? And can we discover new targets? So this is where spatial transcriptomic comes in, into its own really, and this is the approach we took. So we used mouse, mouse, mice that we exposed to one, three, and five days of photooxidative damage to induce retinal regenerations. And then we used the eyes to section. We didn't quite section like this. We actually sectioned per such tree, so, um, the upper region of the eye, which is the superior, and the lower region of the eye, which is the inferior on the same um, slice. The damage usually occurs in the upper region, so in the superior area of the retina, so here, this is the inferior. This becomes important in a minute. And we placed sections on the space transatomic slides and then followed the workflow as Joss outlined so nicely. Um, and then we use single cell sequencing data to um, deconvolute a little bit the spatial data as well to not quite get um, single cell resolution, but get a greater insight. So I've established this novel technique, technique in our lab and um, what Jeff didn't say, you have to do a bit of tissue optimization. And this is just showing you 
an image of what that looks like. This is um, just a dim control. So these are control mice that have not been exposed to any light and a five day photooxidative damage exposed mass by. So you see the sort of um, fluorescent expression that we look for. Um, so we went ahead with that and with the spatial workflow, these are sort of a representative section of what we have used for the slides. So this is the optic nerve here. This is obviously the lens and the cornea. And this is what the retina is. This nice layer here at the back of the eye. And this is on the right-hand side is always the superior region and on the left-hand side is always the inferior region. So damage will occur on this side of the eye. So when you follow this workflow through and then do a spot overlap with where your expression is, this is what that looks like. So we've got the nice overlap with um, expression detection from the Space Ranger software. So first of all, what we've done just to analyze the sequencing itself and the quality of the data. Um, so I should probably say, sorry, we did um, biological duplicates. So we have two samples for each of the DIM, the one, the three, and the five days, and we have eight samples all up. So we integrated all eight samples to remove any batch effect. And that means we've got about 14,300 features across about 5,000 spots across all the eight samples. So you might've noticed that we don't actually with our tissue cover an awful lot of spots in each of the um, capture areas. So we performed some filtering just to get rid of um, potential just badly um, identified spots or sort of expression that is in places where it shouldn't be. So you can imagine that when you place a tissue there might be fragments that are ending up in your capture area. That's not actually the tissue that you want. So we filtered by um, removing spots that have less than 500 features for excessive mitochondrial expression and that removed um, 772 spots for 84 across all eight samples. However, we decided to do another um, assessment which is using SpotClean to analyze spot contamination. This is a publicly available um, package that has been published and that allows you to have a look at how many UMIs from neighboring spots are in each of your spots. And that will tell you whether you have used excessive tissue permeabilization conditions and your RNA has diffused across your slide, which is not what you want. So this shows you our spot contamination. So like I said, we've got replicates for each of the time points and it looks not so great, but when you actually look at what that means per expression, per spot expression, contribution contamination, it's really not great. So the highest contamination is in this sample here, but actually it only contributes to about 3% of your expression. And when we plot where the contamination level is highest across the section, you can see it's sort of in the anterior chamber of the eye and in the vitreous chamber of the eye. So when we did this analysis, we actually found that doing this removes the same spots as using a filtering approach that we use. So they're, they're sort of equivalent. So you can use either. You get roughly the same result. So now what, what do our data look like? So we've used S utility to cluster um, all spots by their expression across all eight samples. And this is what that looks like. So we've identified 20 clusters all up, and you can see that there are some very nicely unique clusters. And when we map, uh, map that back to um, the sections and the tissue they came from, you can see that it's very evenly distributed. So there isn't really anything that stands out as being special or different, which is really nice. We also did an analysis about um, the replicability. So we analyzed the reproducibility between the two replicates from each time point and their correlation is about um, 0.98 or 0.99. So very, very high. So that also shows you that the technology itself is very reproducible and very reliable. And you can get really good replicable, replicate data doing this. Um, so what are those clusters, right? So we've got all these 20 clusters. What are they? Where do they lie? How do we go about trying to figure out what is what? So first of all, we use sort of different analysis steps and you have to find out your own what works for you. What we used first, uh, a variable features analysis of Class, across clusters. So basically differential gene expression across the clusters. And then we overlap that with our morphological data from the HME 
images. And we also integrate a cell type marker gene. So we know that specific cell types in the retina um, express specific genes that only those cell types express. So we can then assign um, cell type majority into particular clusters. So what does that look like? So for example, ganglion, this is a ganglion cell marker, any of, any of them, and we've plotted the expression level across all 19 um, clusters across all eight replicates. And you can see that this is quite highly expressed in cluster four, six, nine, and 13. Um, now, if we use a bipolar cell marker, you can see similar clusters come up, but also there are some differences, right? And then if we now go for an amacrine cell marker, again, this is cluster four, nine, and 13. So these freeze cell markers are really high in clusters four, nine, and 13. So this tells you that these clusters are not single cell resolution. You have a bunch of different cells in each of the clusters. So that's really the take home message. Um, and trying to figure out single cell resolution is actually not straightforward. To do, we've tried that, it's not easy. However, so we used um, cell marker gene expression, morphology and clustering and overlap with morphology to essentially label the clusters, what are they? And on the right here, this is our labeling. It doesn't really mean much to you guys, but I'll show you with those four, three clusters that I've just highlighted, cluster four, cluster nine, and cluster 13, exactly where they are. So this is a blown up a representative, representative image of one of the sections and cluster four, you can sort of see it's sort of on the inside of the retina. Cluster nine has sort of an overlap with even further in, and cluster 13 is right on the outside, on the vitreous. So you really have to use multiple informations to figure out what is what. To show you also what a photoreceptor, so this is the photoreceptor cluster, what that looks like, like this. Now, this is really interesting. So the, the photoreceptors in the underlying image, if you can see that are that blue line, that's all the nuclei of the photoreceptors. And here you can see that's quite a thick line. Here on the right, it's not so thick. Now this particular section comes from a three day damaged mouse. So you can already see that thinning of the photoreceptor layer in the superior compared to the inferior. And what you can also see that now clustering really picks up still the photoreceptor layer here due to their normal photoreceptor expression. But here the layer is thinner, resolution isn't right. So it's not so easily picked up by this technology. It also really depends on how fortuitously you are in putting your tissue on top of the spots. I mean, I've lined this up here really nice by accident. It certainly isn't the case for all of them. So it, it really depends a bit. So it needs a lot of looking into the detail. So now looking at this, you can imagine there is a huge number of analysis that you can do. You can do between clusters at each time point. You can do within clusters across the time points. You can do all sorts of things. You can do go-term analysis of differentially expressed genes of all these comparisons. So it's, it's crazy what you can do with this. It's really, really, really insightful data. Because we look at the retina and we're interested in the retina, we went back to just the retinal layers and combine just the clusters that overlap with what's a retinal layer, pulled them back together and did another clustering. And we were hoping that that would increase resolution. It sort of does and it sort of doesn't. So this is what that looks like. This is the same section I've just shown you. If you want else, there we go. Um, and we can do um, an annotation of what those cells are. So it gives you a little bit more detail but it's not huge. So we went from seven to nine clusters. So it's not, it's not massive. Um, but what we're really interested in, I've already said that the superior side of the retina is impacted by the stress. And so obviously there will be changes in expression in the superior versus the inferior. So that's what we looked at first. Can we see that? What is different? And in a normal control sample, you can see as a volcano plot, there isn't really much difference except those two genes, which are actually known to be enriched in the inferior side of the retina. However, if you go to five days, so these mice have undergone quite extensive damage, um, there is a huge change in expression. And a lot of the genes that are now downregulated in the superior side of the retina are related to the visual cycle, 
which is what we would expect to see. So that's really reassuring that this technology will give us the knowledge and reinforce the knowledge we already have. So what's really interesting though is to do the comparison by time. So how does this progress over the time course when you compare the normal controls to one day, three day and five days? So if we do this, and this is here showing um, the one day against the control, you can see there is a fair bit of dysregulation in the superior region of the retina. So this is only the superior region of the retina. Now, if you go to three days, that gets more. There is a lot more that's dysregulated, and this is even more exacerbated at five days. So you can really see the explosion over time of dysregulated genes in the retina, um, which is really what we're after. And the, the change in timing here is really, that's the nitty gritty we want to get down to. Where are those genes here that lead to this? It can be disrupt or change something here that doesn't lead to this. That's really what we want to know. So what are those sort of genes that are dysregulated in the superior retina? So at day one, on the left here, these are the upregulated genes. So the upregulated grow terms in the superior region of the retina at one day of life damage. And a lot of that is um, immune cell proliferation and immune receptor signaling. On the right here, that's downregulated genes in the superior at one day, and that's sort of extracellular matrix genes and um, the earth cascade, which is involved in um, proliferation and um, cell proliferation. So there's quite a lot. At three days, this gets more significant. And now we are starting to see in the upregulated side, we can see immune response terms coming up and multiple stress-related terms. So really that indicates that at day three, the immune response is highly active which wasn't so clear at day one. So at day three, that's really the point where all the immune response goes up in the superior region. Uh, Down-regulated genes are still extracellular matrix genes. This is very similar to day one. However, at day five, when we really start to see extensive damage of the retina, this immune-related um, terms and cytokine-related terms are really, they're now through the roof. They're significantly more upregulated um, now. And downregulated genes, now we're going to see visual and sensory perception genes that are downregulated, photoreceptor related terms, retinal homeostasis terms. So by day five, we have seriously disrupted the visual cycle, the photoreceptors, and the health of the retina. So this is what we expect to see. This is what we want to see. So that tells us that the data set is great, that it really is very valuable, and that is good, high quality data. So what is in those terms, right? So these are both terms. Let's have a look at that. So let's have a look at day five in the superior of the retina. What are those cytokine production terms and what are the visual receptor terms and where are they? Where are they actually expressed in the retina? So this is what it looks like. What we have done is we took all the, the genes that are um, in the cytokine production uh, go term essentially add them all up in their expression level in each of the spots in the superior region of the retina and just color code that, heat map that. So that's the expression level. The redder it is, the more expressed it is. So this is just in dim controls and this is a five day um, light damage. And you can see that really the cytokine terms go up quite a lot. What I'd like to draw your attention to is that this region here you can see there is a spot in here and in there that is really quite wet compared to the rest. And this coincides with the region that we would expect to show the most damage in the retina. So we can really pinpoint where exactly those genes are going up in which area of the retina. And you can also see this is the retina, not so much in the inner layers. So we can really tell now where exactly is that gene expression. And this is their spatial, it's so powerful. And if you look at the visual perception O terms that I've shown you, you can see in the dim eye, there's a lot of expressions. It will be like rhodopsin and um, other genes that are important in the visual cycle. By five days, they have gone. There's just not a lot there anymore. And it's across the whole retina. So really indicating that the superior side in general is suffering. Although you can see that the edges are still healthier than the middle of it. So that's really interesting. So now we can look at 
the spatial expression of individual differential molecular chains. So one of the genes that has um, come up in the GVAS study, studies is APOE as a marker. So I know there's a marker, but variants of APOE are highly linked to um, the risk of developing AMD. So we thought, well, let's have a look at APOE. So this is the DIM control. This is one day, three day, and five day. I just realized I haven't labeled them. Apologies. And this is now superior and inferior region of the retina, labeling the expression of APOE in each of the individual spots. And you can see there is a lot in the dim rear retina anyway, but by five days, there is really quite a high concentration of expression of APOE in the damaged area of the retina. And we can do this also for a complement pathway gene, C1QA, which is known to be one of the key activators in the complement pathway that then really activates the complement cascade. And you can see in DIM there isn't really anything, and you wouldn't expect anything to be there because there's no damage to the retina other than just normal retinal stress from just light transduction. But the added stress through the um, light damage here really, particularly in the region of damage, really increases the expression of these complement related genes. And C1QA is just one example. We see this for many others, and we see this for. Um, chemokines as well. So this will now allow us to really dive into location differences, neighboring spot differences. So you can here see that this, this spot's really high in C1QA, but there are others nearby that are not. So what's the difference about those? What are the, uh, the cell types that might be in those particular spots that are mediating this? So this is the, the regions that I'm highlighting here to have a look at. So in summary, bulk analysis of the retina that has been done in the past and it's well understood real, that there is a role of inflammatory genes in degeneration. And that's been great, but we've never really been able to highlight exactly where is that happening because bulk is bulk. And if you have a gene that is highly dysregulated but very localized, your bulk analysis may not even pull that out. However, spatial really now reveals the precise location of that dysregulation we can hopefully now identify genes that are very locally dysregulated that we don't see in bulk analysis. And that might tell us a bit more about the biology of AMD and how it initiates and how it progresses. However, we, we still need higher resolution. And yes, we are really excited about the HD version coming out by the end of the year. Um, so we really want that to go forward to identify cell types. Um, we really want to understand how that dysregulation is initiated, what are RNAs play a role, where are they, which cell types are essential in this, and how does this spread across the retina over time. And you can imagine not everything comes on at the same time. There are things that initiate this and then a bit later that leads to that. So we really want to understand those waves of expression that cross the retina in response to degeneration. We also, the lab has a... Um, a vast resource of microRNA data in the retina. We know a lot about microRNAs in the retina. And we can now really use the spatial data and the microRNA data to understand how microRNAs regulate this process. We know microRNAs play a massive role in inflammation in the retina. So we want to know where are those genes that those key microRNAs control? And can we use that to combat um, retinal degeneration by understanding how microRNAs are regulating the immune response in the retina. So that leads me to tell you who's been involved in this. So this is the Clear Vision Research Lab at ANU, which is being founded by Professor Ricardo Natoli. This whole project was a, is a collaboration with Jimen at ANU as well. And the PhD student, Emma, has done all the bioinformatics on this, and she's fantastic. And obviously all the lab members have played a role in this analysis and in informing where this is going with all that previous work. And the project's been funded by NHMRC and the Graduate and Gordon Boots Foundation at John Hilton. Thank you. Any questions? So if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box or alternatively you can um, raise your hand um, using the raise your hand icon and I can unmute you. Um, also, please take a few moments to fill out our short poll, which should have popped up on your screen. We'll really appreciate it.
Um, so someone did type in the chat asking about the recording of this session. So in a couple of days, it will be added to the Millennium Science YouTube channel. And in addition to that, I will send out an email to everyone who's registered with a link to the recording. So, so far, Jeff and Ulrich, there's no other questions in the chat. Oh, there's one that's just come through from Alex Tang. Um, they say, thank you for an interesting talk. Can I ask how many samples or animals you had at each time point to find a statistical difference? Yeah, so I sort of skipped over that a little bit, my apologies. So we had um, two animals per time point and we used one eye of each of the two animals. So that's um, a biological duplicate. And we used the same eye, so either both times the right eye. Actually, I think it was the left eye for all the time points. Time points it was the left eye and it was a male in case you're interested. Um, yeah, so biological, biological duplication, not technical. This is true biological duplication. This actually is a bit tricky because with the eye, the way you're sectioning, you can't guarantee that when you cross section your eye that you're gonna end up in exactly the same spot each time you cross section the eye. We're usually trying to have the optic nerve on it because that gives us an indication of where we are within the eye. But there is no guarantee that it's always in exactly the same spot. There is variability, and we do see some of that variability in the data just because of that. All right, yeah, so uh, another couple of questions come through. Um, so we'll quickly see if we have time for them. Um, so the next one is, how difficult was the Visium sample preparation and slide placement? Is it primarily a manual process? Well, so we did, or I did, I should say, I did the um, fresh frozen version of this very, very early after it came out. So we didn't do antibiotic staining either. Um, so the sample handling, the freezing process is not very difficult. That's actually the, probably the easiest part and the actual processing of the slide is not very difficult either. I would say the most challenging part technically is to get the slice onto your slide for fresh frozen. For FFPE, I imagine that'd be a lot easier because you don't have to handle the slides and everything in the cryostat, they're not so cold. Um, and it's a bit easier to see, but for the fresh frozen, definitely putting the slides on, the slices on the slides. And as you can see, you could see my sections are fantastic. So the side assist will be really, really good because it allows you to just, just section and then pick the best one, which is definitely a, a way forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump in there too and you know, just second that. That's exactly why we're building that instrument. Um, it certainly it can be a pain point for some labs in the workflow is sectioning directly onto the Visium slide. You've got to choose your best sections. Once it's on there, that's the section you're committed to. Whereas with the side system instrument, obviously you section onto a plain glass slide. You can go and look at them, decide which ones you want, don't want. And then you put the plain glass slide in the instrument, you put the Visium slide in the instrument, and the instrument will pair them together and do the molecular transfer from the section down onto the Visium slide. At launch, it's only compatible with FFPE tissue, um, but we do have it in our roadmap, although we're not quite sure of dates and timing and those kind of things to eventually get to uh, working with fresh frozen too. I'll just add another thing here. So actually my second replicate, when I prepared the second replicate slide, um, one of the sections ripped as I was trying to put it on the slide. And then obviously you haven't got a lot of choice, but for the, FF, well, for the fresh frozen, you can remove the sections that have already been placed once. So I did that and then replaced. And it's it's um, a testament to the robustness of the technology that even with removing those sections and putting the slide through that whole process, it really hasn't impacted the expression that we see. So that's also good to know, in fact. So it's all possible. So it's just a matter of practice. You just practice, 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 and you get there. All right, and one last quick question. Um, can you comment on the analysis and how much of the analysis could be done using um, the open source user-friendly software and how much needed to be approached with a more hardcore bioinformatics? I would suspect that most of this you could do with um, Loop Browser, within Loop Browser, or even if you want to go into um, Space Ranger. 
Um, we did a lot of the sort of spot cleaning offline, but you can do that. You can you can choose your spots in by uh, in Loop Browser and probably Space Ranger. Um, I think most of it you can do. There's some excellent um, webinars that 10x has to show you how to work both those. And de definitely um, differential expression is easy in the browser. You can choose your own regions. And I've done that. I looked at the inferior, superior comparisons um, within the same section. Um, how you would compare across different sections, I'm not sure that was done downstream of that with a biomathematician. But yeah, maybe someone else can comment on that from 10x. Yeah, so we have our turnkey. I didn't touch on it just because we didn't have time, but we have two software suites, both of them freely available. So there's the Space Ranger Analysis Pipeline um, that takes obviously your data, raw sequencing data from the sequencer, and it's a turnkey pipeline. So you just put your data at it, run, um, and then from that, you get a bunch of output files. Um, and one of those you can load into our loop browser. Um, and that's what you saw a lot of these images from here. And that loop browser is your intuitive sort of point and click way of exploring data. Um, more complicated functions beyond sort of just exploring single data sets, those kind of things. Um, there are certainly third party tools out there and we certainly encourage their use and you'll find really great tutorials on them online. So I'd point to people towards Surat. Um, and within Surat, if you go to the web page, it's hosted by the New York Genome Center. You can certainly find a very good tutorial on analyzing the spatial transcriptomics to all Visium data. Um, and more specifically to do some of more of that advanced analysis. And we also on our website as well have some really great tutorials on how to use Loop Browser to step through the Visium data too. Yeah, so the S utility package that we used for clustering is within Zora. So we did sort of explore that. And actually the, the, the PhD students has, has really extensively explored all the publicly available pipelines that have been very quickly developed for spatial data out there and there's, there's plenty, so you could go and, and find what works for you to have a look at those. Um, and it's so fast um, amplifying this field. There are so many different technologies available or coming out that this will explode and there will be plenty, plenty packages to support people in analyzing their data. Perfect. And just considering the time, we might wrap up there. Thank you, everybody, for attending and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.